Well, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, it's an honor to be here, to be sponsored by the, uh, uh, the coalition, and to be invited to participate in this chamber activity. I have um, a couple of comments I'd like to make about um, the chamber and, and about my background, and then talk about the topic, which is what do we do about the federal deficit and federal debt? The uh, coalition, firstly, is a bipartisan group of former members of Congress who are, to put it mildly, outraged at the dramatic increases in the federal debt and the failure of the federal government to do anything about it. It's something that uh, propelled me to run for Congress in 1992 when circumstances were far different, but I thought then that the debt was unsustainable. I became active in a group in Congress called the Blue Dog Coalition, which uh, was a bunch of Democrats who were sort of renegades. We were viewed with some suspect in the uh, Democratic caucus, but we were treated fairly. And uh, we worked both with the White House and across party lines to try to craft budgets which would eliminate the deficit. And by the year 1999, in fact, that had happened. And I wouldn't say it was just because of us, but I think because of many factors and many <clears throat> groups and individuals that were working for that goal. And we had a surplus in 2000, 2001, and of course, we all know where we are today. Well, I have left Congress, and I'm now living back in Minnesota, and I feel a certain kinship with Alaska. Um, you have snow, and it's cool. The principal difference in Minnesota, it is cold. So <laughs> it's almost like uh, going to Arkansas or something to come here and see the, uh, the warmer weather. There's another similarity. Uh, at least northern Minnesota, very close to Canada, and highly dependent on natural resources and natural resource extraction. The primary difference is that northern Minnesota got into the game about 100 years earlier. And at this point, the iron ore has largely been used. It's been consumed. It um, fueled the American economy for decades. Our timber was cut. It was clear-cut mercilessly, and we eliminated most of the marketable timber in our state by about the end of World War I. So the consequence is we have scrap timber, and we have marginal iron development or iron ore development. The area of Minnesota where <coughs> I've lived is a lot like Lake Wobegon. And I don't know if you've looked at the Minnesota map and tried to find it, but um, we do have 10,000 lakes, so it's a little elusive. And like some of the people in Lake Wobegon, um, I'm of Norwegian ancestry, and that seems to uh, uh, characterize, for better or for worse, a good portion of our state. There's a lot of problems with that. Uh, you can take pills for being Norwegian, but there's no cure. <laughs> and they say you can always tell a Norwegian, but you can't tell them very much. So, um, and we have a lot of Ole and Lena stories, but I think in the interest of time, I will spare you any Ole and Lena tales. Well, coming to your meeting to discuss the uh, sobering seriousness of the federal budget is a lot like uh, sort of sharing the good news of an impending root canal. So most of us would rather not think of it. In fact, because it was largely caused by others, it really makes us very mad. So nonetheless, uh, here we are in Juneau. You're weighing in on state legislative issues. The federal government is, as I've been hearing this morning, uh, not the most popular entity in, uh, in your deliberations. But it's still important, and as we'll note in a moment, it's important to the American business community in a variety of ways, 
It's important to state, local, and tribal government in Alaska. And I note that uh, Alaska is number one in the country in terms of federal expenditures per capita. It's uh, substantially above uh, any other state in the, in the United States. I think more than twice what the state of Minnesota receives. And it's approximately, as I understand it, one-third of the Alaskan economy. So it's a vitally important part of what your, or what your members of the Chamber of Commerce are doing day in and day out in terms of uh, the, the business that they conduct and the clientele or the customer base that they serve. Well, let's begin with the root canal process. First, I'd like to emphasize that this is not a new subject. It's not a subject that's poorly covered. It's in the national news on a regular basis. It's been talked about, it's been the subject of political presidential campaigns for over two decades. Ross Perot, as many of you may recall, in 1992, mounted a campaign for president on the basis of attacking both political parties for failure to address the problems of the federal deficit. And Ross Perot, with his larger ears and his easy to uh, depict in a cartoon quality, was on TV talk shows, he was in the presidential debates, and he had his famous charts. Uh, and so Ross Perot was really there at all time. So we'll move beyond this uh, first slide to where we've come since the time of Ross Perot. I, yeah, I hope that's not my lunch. <laughs> um, as of two weeks ago, the federal debt was over $15 trillion. Now, this includes the money that's owed to the Social Security Trust Fund and certain other federal trust funds. So some of the money is owed to other federal entities. But $15 trillion, and it comes to $130,000 for every taxpayer in the country. Now, we all recognize that we have more people than there are taxpayers. By my calculation, it's roughly $45,000 for every man, woman, and child that's a resident of the United States. So roughly, family of four, $180,000. We are incurring additional debt at the rate of three and a half billion dollars a day to finance the federal government, which is roughly eight dollars per person per day. So cost of your breakfast each day, if you go to an inexpensive restaurant, eight dollars. Federal borrowing is approximately 30 cents, 36 cents on every dollar that's spent. Make sure I operate this right. This just shows, sort of dramatic form, how the um, federal debt is apt to mushroom under current policies. Well, the consequences of the federal debt on the federal government are unnerving. First, we have interest payments. And these interest payments, although on that pie chart, are not overwhelming. When you think that with the current sort of expenditures, we're going to be at 27% of the federal budget by 1950, which is about one generation from now, that's bad enough, but if you would back out of the blue or the purple portion of that pie chart, the mandatory programs, you know, the entitlement programs, retirement programs, Medicare, so on, and just look at discretionary spending, you would find that interest on the federal debt is currently in the neighborhood of 25% of discretionary expenditures. The impact of this is so dramatic that 
it appears to be a consensus in our country that it must be addressed. For one thing, it will limit our discretion, our ability to deal with crises as they emerge in the future. For another, it's shifting to the next generation, it's shifting to our children. The cost, the liability, the stress of dealing with current service financing for our generation. It's a tremendous intergenerational transfer. The money that we're spending today is being borrowed and has to be financed, handicaps our ability in the future to not only deal with the military budget, but also with things like federal assistance and road construction, airport construction, and all range of federal services. It's tempting to say this is a problem for our grandchildren. The truth is, it's not just a problem for them, it's a problem for our kids and it's a problem for us. If you look at a variety of federal programs, especially Medicare, I would guess that over half of the people in this room are going to find that the Medicare program that they may assume is important for them today will not be there in the same fashion within a generation. So it's our problem. It's not just the grandchildren. Mike Mullen, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, stated that our national debt is our biggest national security threat. I'd like to take a moment to explore some of the dimensions and underlying considerations for this conclusion. Historians have commented that financial instability has been the precursor and the cause of the fall of great powers. Fiscally insolvent states simply lose the ability to compete among great powers. If this country does not have the economic wherewithal to maintain a leading role in international circles, it will affect our ability to provide leadership on issues that we consider vital to our national security. This runs a range from influencing events to inability to provide foreign assistance, ineffectiveness of any sanctions that we might try to impose, difficulty of our country being competitive in the global economy. It also means difficulty in sustaining a defense budget. And with the military bases here in Alaska, you're painfully aware of the size of the defense expenditure, the defense establishment. There's another way of looking at this, and that is there's been a great deal of attention to the problems of Greece, and now Italy, Spain, Ireland. Let me go back a little bit. In the United States, we currently have a debt that is approximately equal to the gross domestic product. Our gross domestic product is in the neighborhood of $15 trillion, and our debt is in the neighborhood of $15 trillion, 100%. So if you look at that as sort of the operating revenue in this country for a year, we, in a sense, have mortgaged it. What's happening in the other countries? Greece is at 130%. Italy at 120%, France at 100%, and Ireland at 95%. So we're approaching the debt levels of these European countries, developed industrial economies that are in deep financial trouble and whose financial plight has threatened the very existence of the euro as a currency. 
There's another dimension of this that I would like to mention, and that is where are we getting this money? Eight dollars a day per person. Well, of course, some of it comes currently out of the Social Security Trust Fund. Some of it comes out of, you know, we buy treasury bonds or treasury bills and so on. But there are others. Our biggest creditor is actually the Chinese. 47% of the public debt in this country is owned by, by foreigners, largely foreign governments. 26% of this is held by China. And if you would add in the oil exporting countries in the Middle East, it would be over 30%. This means that our nation's largest banker, our largest bankers by far, are countries that reject our system of government, reject the concepts of democracy, self-determination, the value that we place on human rights, and even reject the prevailing religion in our country. And in significant extent, we'd like to see it not practiced. Well, you know, the Chinese certainly have not espoused any such diabolical threat to our country. But what does it mean? It means that as we go through you know, all of these foreign affairs disputes and uh, controversies and trade and resource allocation, that our nation's largest banker is in the position to pressure us for favored treatment as a condition of continued financing. Now, of course, the Treasury bonds they currently hold, they're stuck with those. What are they going to do? I mean, in a way, uh, they have to be nice to us. But on the other hand, if they don't continue to invest and especially to purchase new bonds to replace the old ones, it's a tremendous, tremendously stressful item on our fiscal solvency. If nothing else, you would think the future of Taiwan would be somewhat hanging in the balance in terms of the Chinese willingness to invest in our bonds. Well, at this point, I'd like to move just quickly. These, these points uh, indicate the importance of uh, trying to address this debt on the business community in the country and the economy, crowding out private and sector investment, slower economic growth, uh, what it may do to um, uh, interest rates, a whole host of uh, other economic concerns. Well, what's the cause of the debt? The causes of the debt are not hard to explain, and I think most of us have heard so much discussion that uh, just listing them is all that one needs to do. We've got short-term causes. The economic crisis that we hopefully are coming out of uh, has been a tremendous strain and stress on the federal government. Both the entitlement programs where the expenditures are uh, dramatic, the loss of revenue from uh, decreased uh, business activity, lower tax receipts, and then the stimulus packages, the bailout for the financial community, and a variety of uh, uh, tax incentives that have been enacted to try to provide some type of stimulus. You can go back further. The tax cuts in the last decade have also contributed to the debt and the expenditures on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So those are things here that, you know, hopefully we don't, we should not have to deal with uh, every decade that we hopefully can put behind us. But we have other systemic problems with our federal budget which are not so easily overlooked or overcome. Probably the rising health care cost is the largest and the uh, most serious. The Medicare program has unfunded liabilities to people like me I'm just turning 70 in a month, that, that are staggering. It's compounded by the fact that uh, here's the baby, baby boom generation coming along, so we have a 
We have a bulge in our demographics. In addition, we're living longer, maybe because we have better health care. And the cost of health care is going up steadily. Anybody who is providing health insurance for their uh, employees is, is uh, painfully aware of this. Medical devices, new pharmaceutical products, um, sophisticated uh, emergency room, and training specialists, and on and on. We've already talked about interest, interest costs. The irony is that we have had historically low interest rates. And of course, with the federal government's credit rating, they've been able to borrow at the, at the most favorable interest rates available in the world. But that's something we can't count on. When you think of an interest rate of uh, 10%, I mean, I remember when 10% interest was something you just assumed for estate planning. Well, we're, we're far below that, and there is no guarantee that interest rates will not spike again. And finally, long term, the federal government has got a revenue problem. Another example of uh, why the problem is so grim is just the demographics with Social Security. If you go back to 1950, a couple of uh, generations ago, there were 16 people working for each person drawing Social Security benefits. Uh, today, there are three people working for each person drawing Social Security benefits. And in uh, 2035, it's projected there will be two people working. Now, good news for me is that both of my sons are working. <laughs> but um, they will be paying in, and both my wife and I will be drawing benefits. So that's one for one. I mean, we haven't really done our job there, and I don't know about these grandkids. They have two other grandparents, and so it's a heavy burden. And, and uh, it's easy to make uh, in light of, of how it works out in each family, but sitting down and trying to explain this to your grandkids is, is not a pleasant task. In fact, it's one that uh, is perhaps more awkward than even sex education. So. <laughs> Uh, I just I leave it to you figure out how can you have that kind of a discussion gracefully with your kids. Well, next question is what can we do about all of this? And there have been endless studies and commissions and efforts to address all of the uh, problems that we face with the, with the federal budget. Probably one of the most prominent was the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform that was established like, about five years ago. And it was chaired by Erskine Bowles, who had been the um, chief of staff, among other things, for President Clinton, and uh, uh, former Senator Alan Simpson from Wyoming. And uh, this slide just illustrates the, uh, the principal recommendations that came from that commission. It included uh, some prominent members of Congress. It was expected they would never be able to reach consensus on, uh, on their recommendations, but indeed they did. And it took a, you know, Alan Simpson, someone I've known for uh, ever since I taught in Wyoming, and uh, a remarkable person, and uh, he's the person that came up with the phrase greedy geezers. And uh, the AARP, tried to defeat him when he ran again for election. But Alan Simpson's uh, staying power was beyond their political influence. He's also characterized the political process as slow and sloppy. Having served in the Senate, he's well aware of how sloppy it is. He has explained that um, almost everybody is grouchy when it comes to uh, telling them that either they should pay more tax or they should just get over the benefits that they've had and. Uh, and get along without them. So he's, he, he's the person that uh, is remarkably candid, uh, and his candor is refreshing. He's pointed out that what we're facing is probably the most predictable economic crisis in the history of our country. Well, I would say at this point, the bowles simpson plan is largely forgotten. 
it's been eclipsed by the efforts, or we had hoped it would be eclipsed by the efforts of the Super Committee. And as you'll recall, when the uh, federal debt limit debate was uh, going on last year, the compromise that was ultimately reached was that we would have this uh, bipartisan, bicameral super committee with the power to come up with a grand scheme for addressing our debt problem, and that the Senate and the House would vote on that scheme up or down. So there was this expectation that the super committee would finally bring us to the promised land. Half of the members were from the House, half from the Senate, half were Republican, half were Democrat. Well, as I'm sure most of you know, the super committee's efforts failed. They could not reach a majority that would approve any particular recommendation, and the consequence was it was disbanded. So the question is, what do we do? How do we reduce the debt? What needs to be done? Again, there are no magic solutions. We just talked about the super committee. We talked about the Bowles-Simpson committee. Um, we have to address discretionary spending. Uh, we have Defense Department cuts that are being talked about. Um, Leon Panetta, within the last two weeks, has uh, come forth with, I think it's a $400 billion uh, series of uh, uh, cuts that he's going to recommend as the Secretary of Defense. We've talked about health care, cost containment, uh, the um, health care plan, the Obama plan, uh, is a, a start in that, in that regard. Social Security reform. I spent quite a bit of time when I was in Congress working on Social Security reform. We tried to get together a bipartisan plan. We went down to the White House. We met with President Clinton. One thing that impressed me was that President Clinton was conversant with the details of what had to be done to address the Social Security problem. We talked about the cost of living adjustment and the reliability of the consumer price index as an indication of the cost of living. And Clinton knew the economic analysis of the cost of living index and what was wrong with it. He could discuss it as well as anyone in the room, including the Secretary of Treasury. And he announced that uh, Speaker Gingrich and he were going to get together and decide whether or not they could come up with a proposal that Gingrich could go back and sell to the Republicans in Congress because at that point he was the Speaker and he had the majority, and that Clinton would try to sell to the Democrats. We never heard any more about it. So Social Security reform has defied uh, the efforts of many people here in the last 20 years. Other spending cuts. And then I'd like to just take a moment to talk about, um, first, you know, the phrase going big, and secondly, uh, tax expenditures. Uh, going big is something that uh, many people have urged because if you once start this bloodletting process of eliminating programs, you might just as well get it all on the table and have everybody donating a quart of blood at the same time and have one grand scheme. And I remember in the early 90s with President Clinton when there was a budget reconciliation bill and uh, this was going to sort of solve things for all time. And uh, here I represented probably the most agricultural congressional district in the United States. The largest city was smaller than 20,000 people. Hundreds or thousands of, of these small farms. And I said, the farmers in rural Minnesota will take a dramatic reduction in the farm programs if it is a shared sacrifice. And what we're doing is too humble. And I had calls from everybody including the White House, saying you got to get on board. We can't have any Democrats as an outlier. I ended up voting against the proposal, and I went home, and uh, I was roasted by the Democrats in Minnesota, but the Republicans loved me, so <laughs> it was a strange experience.
Well, that's going big. One concept that's hard for a lot of us to really grasp is uh, what's called um, spending in the tax code. Now, we've talked about insufficient revenue, but tax expenditures sounds like some sort of clever Washington phrase uh, to tell you that um, uh, the way the, uh, the tax code is structured really means that you're getting money from the federal government. Well, um, I'd just like to show you what's in that list and, and sort of how it's calculated. By far the biggest tax expenditure is the credit, not the credit, the uh, exclusion from income for employer-furnished health insurance. That exclusion from individual income costs the U.S. Treasury $170 billion a year. It's enormous. The second largest one is the uh, exclusion or the deduction for those that itemize of mortgage interest. But $89 billion a year. Well, you can just see how these go. Now, I know for me, I've you know, had substantial mortgages. I've thought, you know, why should I be paying tax on the money that I have to put aside to pay interest on this mortgage? And health care, uh, my goodness, you know, that's a kind of unexpected expenditure. And if I have insurance or whatever, I shouldn't have to pay tax on that. So every time I turn around, I think that these make perfect sense they belong in the tax code. These are things that we should be encouraging in our society, home ownership, responsibility for your health care costs, and so on. And the tax code is a place to accomplish that. Well, it's not cheap. And if we're going to have a flat tax, most of the flat tax proponents are recognizing that most of these items disappear. So hold on to your wallets because uh, maybe the tax rates would go down but um, your actual taxes uh, might end up increasing substantially. So there's just a list of what those are. And, and you'll notice that the um, uh, child tax credit and the charitable contributions are not really the biggies, uh, even though they're, they're significant. Well, it's time to sort of wrap up some of these comments. And I'd like to um, emphasize that uh, you know, the time has really come when something has to be done. We can't solve the problems by spending cuts alone. We can't tax our way out of the problems. We can't grow the economy to solve the problem. It's going to take a combination of everything. And we're reaching what you could charitably call is the tipping point. And I say this because when you look at economies like Greece, Ireland, hate to even talk about Iceland, but some of these other countries, the point becomes when the uh, creditworthiness of the obligations being issued, let's say by Greece, to finance its expenditures are not acceptable. And the, the financial community rates down the bonds, and the interest rate goes up. And once that starts, it's hard to reverse. And once you start to raise the revenue or cut the programs in order to bring your budget back into something resembling balance or at least a, uh, a defensible trajectory, the political turmoil, as we've seen in Greece, is phenomenal. And I don't think there's any reason to believe that in this country, if we reach that tipping point, that it would be some sort of a painless exercise to finally make the hard choices. Many of us would deeply resent any cut that we think, or any tax that we think, is not right. I remember Dan Rastankowski, the legendary chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. He helped enact changes in the Medicare program. He went back to Chicago. He had a safe seat. They threw tomatoes at him and at his car. He went back to Washington and they restored many of those cuts within a month. Well, 
That's just an example of the type of uh, reaction that it engenders. Here you see the cost of waiting. If we do something now, the cost of reform is far less than if we wait to 2020 or 2025. Well, I'd like to just summarize in closing a handful of points that I think are important. First, the concept of the tipping point. Economists talk about this, and we don't know what the tipping point is, but when we hit it, we won't know how to gracefully get out of our dilemma. Secondly, remember the question or the point about national security. The debt is the single greatest threat to our nation's security, according to Mike Mullen, the former chief of staff, or the joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The third point I'd like to emphasize, whatever is done is going to be painful for all of us. And the fourth is we've got to get active and work together and insist that our congressional representatives and senators make the hard choices and that they in turn work together. I saw far too much in Congress where there was scheming about the next election. Far too much where there was a determination not to let the party that happened to control the U.S. House of Representatives or the White House get credit for any good initiative. They might be reelected. There was far too much effort to try to pass the blame on or to sugarcoat what had to be done so that your constituency or your reelection was not threatened. We've got to get together and make this work. Winston Churchill once said, you Americans almost always get it right, but only after you've tried everything else. <laughs> well, we've tried a lot. We've tried commissions. We've tried to you know, promote good activities. We've tried Ross Perot, but we still haven't gotten it right. It's encouraging to me to think that our country has survived with the self-governance experiment for 230 years, longer than any other country in the history of our civilization. Despite a civil war, other turmoil, a depression, a dramatic recession, we continue to have these institutions of self-governance and enjoy our, our, our liberties and freedoms. But our ability to sustain this is dependent on our ability to solve this problem in the years ahead. It, in my opinion, is the most important task that we face. Thank you. Thank you, David.